Good evening. And uh, good evening and welcome to the fall 2013 Holloway Poetry Series. I'm Cecil Giskin. Christopher Miller and I are the fall curators of the series, and uh, we, we thank you for coming this evening. Before I introduce tonight's readers, let me tell you what's coming up in the rest of the series this fall. All the readings, all the events will take place in this room at 6.30. Um, on the 26th of September, Keston Sutherland, this year's visiting Holloway poet, will read, and that reading will be followed by a reception down the hall in the English department lounge. We've just placed an order with the caterer for that, and so the whole evening should be quite, quite wonderful. Please plan on coming back for that on the 26th. Um, a sad event, on the 1st of October, the Holloway series will host a memorial reading for Seamus Heaney who died, as you know, on the 30th of August. Seamus Heaney taught in, in the 1970s at, um, at Berkeley, and a reception will uh, follow the reading, that reading is, as well. On the 10th of October, uh, Thursday, Alice Notley will read. On the 17th of October, just a week later, Yusuf Komanyaka will give a reading. And on the 21st of November, Tyrone Williams will read. Tyrone Williams reading is an event in the Holloway, is also an event in the Holloway Mixed Blood Collaboration. That means in addition to the evening reading, he'll give a talk on the intersection of the languages of poetic innovation and the languages of race earlier in the day at four o'clock. I'll mention that, that books by many of tonight's readers are available for purchase here after the reading, thanks to our friend Peter Burkhart at the University Press Books. Uh, 15 copies of Mixed Blood uh, are also available for free to the first, uh, first uh, 15 people who want one. Uh, tonight, uh, the faculty will show what we've been, we've been up to. I will introduce the poets and then we'll proceed with one exception in, in alphabetical order. Uh, uh, John Campion is the founder of the ecotropic movement which holds that for human culture to be healthy, it must exist as an ecological, or in an ecological niche and relate appropriately with all the fields of forces. Three book length poems from a projected series of five form the backbone of this push. Tongue stones, squaring the circle, and most recently Medusa, where the ancient myth finds contemporary expression as every man suffering in a world of political surveillance and disconnection discovers himself in psychotherapy for transgressions against women, the other, and the planet. Campion's poetry has been called a kind of landscape architecture of the page, and in this vein, he has labored to extend these efforts into both art and music. The recent installation, Texturals from the Medusa, a walking book, and the, um, at the Worth Writer Gallery uh, presented his illustrated poems called Texturals. These were hung from a mobile labyrinth of copper pipes. Visitors to the gallery read their way through the exhibit and uh, out of the maze. He's also collaborated with musical composers, including Cindy Cox and uh, Edmund Campion. His other books include Where Three Roads Meet, uh, Sip, -up, uh, Sip -up Poo, The Kiva, An Inverted Bat, and Ecotropic Words, Works, Panagia, El Sueño, and Swing Low. Uh, Cecil Giscom, that's me, is the author of a number of poetry books and a book of linked essays about race, family, and Canada. He's the curator of the Mixed Blood series here at Berkeley, which is allied with the Holloway, as I mentioned before, and editor of the journal Mixed Blood. With the painter Judith Margolis, he is at work on a project called Gazetteer, which is a series of imaginative maps. And he's uh, at work on a new poetry book, Plantation Songs, from which you'll read this evening. Two new prose books, Ohio Railroads and Backburner, will come out in the next several months. Lynn Higinian is a poet, small press publisher, and translator. She's the author of over 20 books, including most recently, The Book of a Thousand Eyes. She has undertaken numerous collaborative projects, including a composition called K Tron, with music by John Zorn. Two mixed media books, The Traveler and the Hill and the Hill and The Lake, created with the poet, or with the painter rather, uh, Emily Clark. The award-winning experimental documentary film Letters Not About Love, directed by Jackie Oakes, and The Grand Piano, an experiment in, co in collective autobiography 
co-written with nine other poets. Wesleyan University Press has just published a guide to poetics journal writing in the expanded field 1982-1998, co-edited by uh, Lynn Hagenian and Barrett Watton, an anthology of works on key issues first published in poetics journal, which, uh, which they founded in 1982. Jeffrey G. O'Brien is the author of People on Sunday, just out two weeks ago, I believe, um, and, uh, and Metropole, out in 2011, also Green and Gray and the Guns and Flags Project, uh, all the later books from the University of Cal or California Press. His chapbooks include Hesiod and Poem with No Good Lines. He is the co-author with John Ashbery and Timothy Donnelly of three poems and in collaboration with the poet Jeff Clark of 2A. Jeffrey O'Brien is an associate professor of English at UC Berkeley and also teaches at the Prison University Project at San Quentin. John Shoptaw has written a book on John Ashbery, an opera libretto on Abraham Lincoln, and has finished a book of poems on the Mississippi River Basin, parts of which have appeared in Common Knowledge, The New Yorker, and elsewhere. Keston Sutherland is this year's Holloway poet. And he is the author of White Hot Andy, Stress Position, The Stats on Infinity, The Odes to TL61P, and other books of poems, essays, and scholarly researches, many of them on Marx. He runs Bark Press and the Sussex Poetry Festival in Brighton in the United Kingdom, where he lives and teaches English and critical theory at the University of Sussex, and where he founded the Brighton branch of the new Socialist Revolutionary Party, Left Unity. Um, Robert Haas, who cannot be here tonight because he had a family event, uh, his most recent book is a collection of essays, What Light Can Do. He's currently teaching a class in verse translation and team teaching and introductory environmental studies, of course. Uh, he's not here tonight, but he has sent something for me to read in his absence. This is poem by Bob Haas. Thinking about it, I thought of the Southern Pacific out of Chicago at midnight, winter of 1971, and the young guy in the club car just before it closed, back from Vietnam and working in a slaughterhouse in Kansas City to which he was returning. It had a few, showed me his hands. Fucking cow blood, he said. You can't get it out completely, though the open palms looked unsplotched. What is the word? Incarnadine, to me. The little winking lights out the window in the dark was light from the locomotive glowing in the eyes of jackrabbits frozen on the winter prairie as we hurtled south toward Albuquerque. Message from Bob Hess. And so uh, the next reader will be, uh, will be John Campion, followed by, followed by me, followed by Lynn Higinian, Jeffrey G. O'Brien, John Shoptaw, and Keston Sutherland is the cleanup hitter. So please welcome the poets, starting with John Campion. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you. I've grown to believe that uh, the world itself, the things in it, the processes, the internested sets, the assemblages, the consortia of existence and non-existence uh, tell poets what they should do. Sometimes it's not such a pleasure. Sometimes it is. And one of the things that has told me to do is to do these long books, <laughs> these long poems. And the last one I did was Medusa. And I think that every age creates its own Medusa. It's, uh, and I think that it's as part of the process of finding the medicine that the sickness needs, uh, it's a good idea to, to try to look at its face since we've made it. 
so I thought this evening uh, I would try to, uh, with you, uh, try to look a little bit at it. it. The reason for that is not only because it's the last uh, book that I've done but and completed, but also I came across something in Catch-22 the other day and asked the question, where are the Snowdens of yesteryear? Uh, I thought maybe we could shed some light on that question. Does Foucault still think power produces reality? Being dead now more than ever, light pollution obscures the stars, putting time out of joint. We live in the sixth great extinction, the seventh or eighth, if you include the blotting out of memory held in the lights above. The great dimming, a true dark age shields us and facilitates our special choice to die from fire and ice. Furthering the American norm, most people build west weapons because the pay is good, but most useful is the unused tool. So just how ugly are we? Oh, Pansa Mia, once interviewed by the CIA, the cooking school, I squawked to turn a dolphin into a killer or make a sound so loud to terrify everyone, though nobody could hear. Without emptiness, the house is empty. But we don't go hurting folks willy-nilly. Fear of punishment is usually enough. Besides, if you design well, they're better for the environment. Nice of you to help. When the work's done, there's nothing left to do. Total institutions create total in individuals see no contradiction between the work of God and the work of the bomb. The one you share your secrets with controls your liberty. So remember to carry, I don't need no stinking badges, but at all times concede as when a ma masher with wicked eyes flashes his headlamps and freezes skittish girls caught in their exposure. The capacity to make a case of your subject through the work of observation is central to the weaponization of existence. It takes a mess of punches, but such strange tabulations move us from theory to practice. The holes count off each one. The power of negative capability grows with the numbers inscribed in the card, just the size of a dollar. Guaranteeing our nation's doctor the tools to confirm his diagnosis. How better for us to play both ends against the middle and live to pick up the pieces. Let us pay tribute to this dream of reason and sing as they did once a silent night, recalling how our wondrous machine made them all light up their empty Hanukkah rows of big blue candles. So go fill the holes where you left off. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. Da 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 da. In no case shall the said Bernard Bodley be. But to rivet the old phoenix on them. Project 24 PSYOPs, nailed an eye to the house opposite anyone still enough in his right mind not to support us. When they'd come burbling fear, we buddy-buddy took them for drinks, later a brothel, extraordinary rendition, to get some tight pictures, then off to the pit for a little torture and abuse. The photos 
The photos helped enlist them in special units, infiltrating areas off limits, say Cambodia. Once on the trail of righteousness, they'd radio the position of villages sympathetic to the enemy. B-52s bombed both parties, killing two birds with one stone, as it were. Eventually, of course, the adversary began to track the lightly armed teams coming in for surveillance and census duty. Utilizing this opportunity, heavily fortified squads followed hard by, leveraging the company's guerrilla bait appeal to keep kill ratios high and funding guaranteed. What about the rights of non-combatants? During wartime, which is now all the time, and everywhere, there's no such thing. Out of sight, operational zones maintain the public trust in democratic institutions. But I hasten to re-add, the chill is greater when the subject is uncertain of the actual conditions of observability. As the embedded journalist, psychiatrist, lawyer, grocery, teacher, etc., complete the architecture of surveillance experienced by hopeful innocence. The pyramid scheme of the dollar with the eye at the strategic end embodies the panopticon. There's nowhere to hide. In every cell is written, He knows when you are sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows when you've been bad or good. So be good for goodness sake. Every thought we take prisoner for Christ renders pliant enough patriots enable the new world order annuit coeptis. Compartmentalism facilitates division of labor, reaches its logical extension when thoughts are top secret. Total information awareness preserves the disease. Of course, the price of continuous propaganda is public indifference. Now, look in here. What do you see? Guess who? Whatever I want you to. Perception management provides the means of social control, a necessary precondition for directing the flow of history. Under this regime, if people see the forbidden truth, but the mind won't admit it, they won't be turned to stone. We fill the frame with our desire. Your punishment, the ugliness yet to be seen, we pronounced Project Democracy. Too abused to make sound judgments, the masses' special treatment strikes a preemptive blow towards implementation of the mechanism. My fingers, separate but equal, can still turn the fucking channel. You're on and nobody daddy watches TV. Or even make a fist to smash the thing. The eye you think you're watching you may turn down but not off. Our memory will run out altogether. Ah, here's a special Nagasaki survivor. Noteworthy by virtue of opposing patches, black and white, forever etched into her back, mirroring, of course, the dual colored florals from her printed dress. It's all Medusa all the time, right here on the Medusa Broadcasting Network. <clears throat> to remain awake, the Buddha cut off his eyelids. Where they fell, the ground produced sangsara. So when painting the eyes of the Buddha, look into a mirror. Upon completion, you will be blindfolded and taken before an object of no consequence. 
This you will destroy with your own liberated gaze, harmlessly channeling the powerful streaks of lightning. So the problem, dear boy, is not in seeing, but in being seen. Thank you. Uh, Cecil Kissam is next. Thank you, John. I'm going to read uh, uh, two poems and uh, portions of a uh, of a third. And the first is called Iowa House. Summer 2013, written after reading Mark de Severo's dream book. Oh, thank you, Keston. Iowa House, summer two, 2013. Put up in Iowa City and up from having dreamt of being very high in the air over Seattle, as though I were dead and looking down, but seeing only King Street Station and nearby the sprawl of Safeco Field where the Mariners play, and where, in memory, looms the figure, though not in the dream, in lights of a Negro repeatedly swinging a baseball bat. Though the dream had to do with its own teetering height over two landmarks, that riddle, and not Elliott Bay or wide Puget Sound, no water in the dream, or even fabulous Alaska Way from which the ferries depart. Instead, the spire on King Street, practically an all beneath me, and the graduations of the baseball field. Who has not been, who among you could not have been, in some sense, on trail? Proximate, part of a similarly imperfect triangle, the two of them, stadium, train station, meaning something different from one another. No water to the dream and no bridge either. At the foot of the Iowa house, though, <clears throat> at the foot of the Iowa house, though, was a river and bridges and also in memory, the fact of my father summering in Iowa City, 1942 or 1943, of his having met then both Jewish guys and white guys, he told me 60 years later at the university. For a time, toward the tail end of the 20th century, I lived in Seattle above Ravenna Park and can remember the city easily because of that. A poem called Camp Town. Flesh or fable, either one, far be it from me, please yourself. We came along the hill's shoulder from the lowest point or field, nothing now, and I imagined as we walked that perhaps a monster could walk over similarly, could scale the wall, as it were. But Camp Town's almost untenable. It's barely haunted. Whose fault is that? Form is harsh. Form is just a hull. A monster could slip across a bridge in the wee hours when traffic's not heavy from one place or another to Camp Town. Please yourself. I was a ship on the stormy ocean. Stay off me, brother. I might be a monster, but neither will I judge you. Two, Camp Town's no accident, no joke, no dichotomy, but Camp Town's noisy. The parts are all out of proportion. That that makes it dangerous is weak argument, or it's only an argument. My sense of distance gets in the way sometimes. I speak from locations, and that has got its limits. What's afoot in such, one might ask? Or what has rolled in? How did we seem to appear on the dog leg up and then on the hillside? That is, what do they see first? The crocodile itself? or a monster 
making a desultory retreat. Nobody likes that, ahead of capture. I will level with you, Camp Town Lady. I think this could dwarf us both. Three, Lons excuse me, three, monster lurching through, taking it up, sprawled like Canada Lee over several seats on the bus. Border towns are the real deal. Camp towns different. And um, let me find it. I'm at work on a uh, in that in that same that same series of poems, the plantation songs. I'm at work on a. A uh, poem vaguely about Pennsylvania uh, called Negro Mountain. Negro Mountain is a 30 mile long ridge of the Allegheny Mountains extending from Deep, Lake, from Deep Creek Lake in Maryland north to the Castleman River in Pennsylvania. The summit of Negro Mountain is the highest point in Pennsylvania. That's 3,213 13 feet. She said, get your bearings. The Commonwealth was lousy with bears. A child's judgment, obligation, then denial. I'd misread silence as sleep. Sometimes the music comes, slowed down, music slowed down, dumbed down to nothing. Noise in the bushes, boys and girls, campfire story, silence in the bushes. In a movie, made in the last year of the 20th century, Negroes stole Dracula's body with predictable results. But it's just that to be alive is to be dead as well. That joke, like a sour stomach. What foolishness is this opposite me? Tangle, unloosen me, ride the tangle out. Unimaginable, this tangle, embarrassed at it. Train came for me to ride. Dream, and I knew it. Dark yellow color. It's a string of dirty yellow cars. Coaches. I can pass until I speak. She said long ago that people would be jealous and try to thwart us. Another grammar, though, for the trouble white people bring. And once you know the grammar, once you master it, you're more whole in those situations. I was taught to look the other way, look further off, look over their heads, look like what? As though death were as complicated as leaving town. Watch verbs. Thank you. Linda Ginian. Thank you, Cecil and Christopher, for organizing this. Thanks, all of you, for coming. Welcome to another academic year in poetry land. Um, I'm going to start by reading a poem by uh, the Russian poet Arkady Dragomoshenka, who died a year ago today in uh, now St. Petersburg, Russia. Um, it's called Six Hours to Waking If You Don't Sleep. Wesleyan University Press is uh, a book of, of uh, Dragomoshenka's selected poetry was in the works um, at the time that he died. He died very unexpectedly and, and suddenly. Uh, and the book is now, I just saw galleys of the pages that I contributed translations to. Um, and it's, it will be out shortly. This is one of my translations. Six hours to waking if you don't sleep. It's no longer possible to gather up all the empty bottles, the needles, thimbles, money, nor understand where the light ray lies, where the steel thread stretching across the road though undoubtedly it's at the bus stop diagonally across the way where the kiosk sours like the sky. Like 
while all the rest pertains to the roof of the mouth, lifting within itself the complex and somewhat crumpled material of non-existence, a cocoon, darkness, and in stammering, lightning, and exile. The 39th hexagram is nothing like this. It is also not possible to gather berries, unless I'm wrong, nor the tossed aside neckties from wherever they fell, nor to write an ode on the rising of dust, nor to whisper in an ear, oh, how I would have wanted. And yet it's possible, yes, absolutely. The possibility of going out still remains without smashing the glass with your forehead, without shredding the colored papers, tickets to the world's edge, or empty gauze, its crackling is dry, like the morning's clocks devouring crickets. Like the Tibetan windmills of hope, these white millstones are gentle, or rather restrained, but immeasurably lacking in water. The stirring of the wind brings no joy. And now I'm going to read just a, a few of a series of uh, 14 line long elegies which are meant to achieve absolutely no resolution um, in order to express uh, how completely unacceptable death is. Um, this is an elegy for Arkady Trofimovich Dragomoshenka. A grasshopper singing of death laughs long as if a heavy-hearted granny spoke a light word. A shadow scuds over glass, the glass stands still. Insects seethe, and they say that is the dream of language. But what is language if not what is threading through the veins of an insect's wings? What does it mean to say now, now, as now surfaces in a gesture as of a person pushing his eyeglasses up toward his brow. Our luggage is stacked sky high. We are wearing 20 layers of clothes. Every utterance is symphonic. I've never made curtains for these windows, stabbed by the mid-morning light. I pass with a broom, standing with a hose in my hand and my thumb against the nozzle. The loops of time droop, fall slack, and someone steps out of those that were his or hers, hers or his, his and hers, his and his, hers and hers. Is it right then that we are left to hurdle alone? The girls dance in dead light, the cadavers lay in live light, but as for those girls, men with mouths like mare vaginas watch them. Every rough rupture demands elasticity of the imagination. The Silver River is irreversible, but you attentively watch its mouth. What you write achieves its independence, though you are nimble, arrogant, sly, and wise. That is how you spend the day, which is itself a powerful force, and raises the significant question, how did you get here? All suffering is in the egg. Now suck it out of its shell and spit it away. During the later years of my war, you were a milder, you were, sorry. During the later years of my war, you were a middle soldier in the army of the metronome. Do not say she was my bother, parting ways, O oh mother of my brother. Let's go to bed to lie to ourselves, leadenly in leisure. Mars, melody, pigeons in a laundry basket, and a little dancer's body knowledge. Whatever. Word hover. I've got my black look on, but it's wearing thin white cat hairs. Appearance of the world. Disappearance of coherence. The empty page provides a preparatory pleasure, or perhaps it instigates a preparatory desire. I have sharpened the carmine and vermilion. I could plunge through the hole in my tongue, but I think, and then I bellow. I ask myself, what is argon? And tell myself it is a noble gas, just as argo is ignoble speech, the can your ass of those who can. Si se puedes, the strikers chant. 
In the night sky, dimmer than the Pleiades, stretch the strings of the star's guitar. Canvas bourgeois zero. One day a woman I'll name another day hitched her pelicans to a raft and went to sea. Every day, all the way, wheel it. Unless one gets the picture, one can't get the caption. So I was in the tree, one foot in the air, and it was there, as I sucked juice from a lemon through a peppermint stick, that I saw the, the dinner guests arrive. Fluorescent navy flowers, incandescent sand buttons, and militant blazing fireflies, yes or no? As a rider of a city bus, I am in the early morning light at the window a fly. Or as a fly, I am a city rider at a window in the early bus light. Windows, walkways, leaves to abandon. As a bow-shaped bird of prey, she hovers as an inclination in its freedom. Damage is not the same as discontent, but may elicit insincerity rather than sarcasm, perplexity rather than allegories, whizzing samurai shuttlecocks. I am open to jeremiads. One winter's evening on wheels dreary, the human face flapped its feet. A great gaseous ghost is growing in a notch. It sleeps below the telephone lines that send ideas between ears. Have you never filled potatoes with bitter butter? And last one, isn't worry wooden? Appearances burn to perfection, the same old frolic, permanent atoms becoming astronauts and then unbecoming them again. There was never and will be never, and once she was like a gazelle commanding a field. Violent is the violin. Deep is the speed with which the Great Wall of China wanders. Serene is the soot far up the chimney, venting the smoke from the long life log. The sun keeps its secret. The daily news is sunk in light. This is a melody played on a cock harmonica, lyrics lost in a story buried under a bellicose rock. Could she and why? What butter? The barefoot musician fiddles on the ice with greater weight over the years, and the juggler's jugs get lighter. It's not from an aphorism that you'd want our memories to rise. You'd resist, persist, preside. Life is full of indubitable data, indelicate stuff. Though drawn to the claims of the sky, I duck my vertigo and devour a huge sandwich, my commitment to gravity, which holds my shadow to the ground. We are subject to the ultimate disorientation, a cloud of invisible power. The sun is surefire. Thanks. And now, Jeffrey G. O'Brien. Hi. Thank you to Christopher and Cecil for convening us all and for the other events to come. I'm going to read two poems from this new book, People on Sunday, and then a new one. Um, the first drops a lot of names, and as someone just told me, picks them up. It's called Distraction. Spencer coined blatant to show us the scandal of truth can only be invented. The same holds true for you in whom subject and object sound alike a common depth, quote, the never other than lost continuity, Alan Grossman defines as present wherever poems are present. Stein says they will not nearly know, as if she were one of the romantics, but is not talking about a ruin or freeze. What is she talking about? The etymology of blatant, which has caused speculation precisely because it was coined. The fact that Spencer used it to modify beast makes its kinship with blatant, bleeding, in 16th century Scots, appealing. But the Latin blatire to Babel also makes sense in context. Stein is blatant, especially in stanzas in meditation, from which the quotation above comes, as does, quote, you should never be pleased with anything. Both quotes address the you of poetry, at a point where knowing and pleasing lose their hold. 
This is the faith behind the wager of the 18th century actor Richard Daly, who believed the mind of the Irish to be so perfectly athwart the subjective and objective states that he was willing to bet, quote, a word of no meaning should be the common talk and puzzle of the city in 24 hours. In the course of this time, the letters Q, U, I, and Z were chalked or pasted on all the walls of Dublin with an effect that won the wager. The etymology of quiz is blatant, that of blatant quizzical, which is not the case with stanza clearly from dwelling or room in the Romance languages, but really from stare to stand. So when Stevens writes stanza my stone, he is asking that Stein be made into a place to stand for poetry. But of whom does he ask this? For Alan Grossman, the answer is staring you in the face, while for Spencer, it's under the dragon skin of community. It must be relentlessly tested, even forgotten, then resurrected, haunting poems like the floating face of Absalom Absalom that accompanies Sutpen down off the mountain into an understanding of class. Dragon skin is also the name for a type of flexible body armor produced by Pinnacle, made of high tensile ceramic disks arranged in an imbricated overlapping configuration, then encased in an aramid textile cover. There's a level five variant not available to the general public, but the public needs no protection so long as it stays general. Not that it does, unfortunately, especially in Stein, where, quote, in changing it inside out, nobody is stout. Her poem babbles on until you live in the rooms of Grossman's account of Crane's The Broken Tower, a poem he argues is about vocation, another calling. Here's a wall and some chalk. Um, that's the literature poem. And uh, here's the protest poem, since those are the two purviews of the English department. <laughs> Actually, I hadn't intended the segue, but the last one ends with talking about potentially chalking a surface. And we've just discovered that it's illegal to chalk surfaces at Berkeley. You will be detained if you do so, which could then produce another protest. And so it goes. Um, this poem is called Thanatopsis, a fancy word for sight of death or a meditation on death. Poems often like to do those meditations in the spring. Um, and this is in part about the events of November 9th, 2011, over in Sproul. But other things too. Thanatopsis. Here again, just a few minutes to see what we've done with what they let us have. Like spring in Washington, D.C., the way we're taught to imagine days as reprieves from other days. Cherries snowing in expressiveness, the nation's capital, an experience of how it is to be caught up in pink and white again. This year is somewhat different in that there are very few days. They have names like N9 and M1, what they've let us do with what they can't keep us from having, a stand your ground law to address weeks of solid rain, the street that goes on where the way is closed, responding to events as they spread from each instance to the live rule, requiring them like spring requires trees to flower at points along their branches. Today is M22, a private garden and a public square, the path between them, traced by daylight saving time over the freedom of George Zimmerman. Like his ability to move in fantasy, certain days don't stop but shed new ends continuously, as though in lives not defined by the clock of limited resources. Other days not yet here, a greater scarcity of water, the first of the new kind of arrests, already reach back through their inevitability into potentials of the present tense, the stare of passers-by as you make a viewing party of yourself, shouting, drop the charges, stemming from N9 on the one hand, while on the other, wanting Zimmerman in chains beyond the room in which he finds himself. Meanwhile, the purple no one saw fall, dotting the concrete outside my house like a pattern unpursued, doesn't seem to leave the Paulonia any bearer a participant in day, but temporarily immune. As the resources disappear, there will be several such readjustments, but will they be chosen or imposed? Probably the latter than the former, 
then both, going on together like towers, working in tandem without looking up to see what day it is or was. They ruin time while we have it. I'm going to end with a new poem called After England, which I wrote after coming back from England and Keston Sussex Poetry Festival. Um, I'm going to dedicate it to Steve Goldsmith because it, it was produced in me by reading his recent book, Blake's Agitation. After England, my voice carries further, almost all the way to the face. I go, but not forth, or I went suspended itself, touching the all that isn't. After England, it could not be kept together, hasn't fallen apart. Moves like noon shadows, forced out from the corners, along a street of expectations. Not really. After England used to has a present tense. Materials stay both stolen and mine. Anthology without exclusions, where I imagined I saw the time after England before it arrived. I went out to meet the thing behind things, displeased with all the available combinations living after England is, then isn't where laughter opens onto the short-lived feeling you should know how to go whole days doing. You had everything you needed, but do not, after England, have a fucking clue. The food no longer safe, phrases stop short of, no news is good, good things come, all signs point, objects may appear, it has the ring. Possession is nine-tenths, firing on all, Ignorance is, my lips are, the grass is, always. After England, the feel of not to feel, when sky invisibly divides to let tomorrow in, where it's better to work than not to, far better to do neither. In fact, that's your job now, reaching out to touch a gloved hand to the face of the weather we walked off in. After England, muttering England has never been enough after itself, this little one, where a good price is contradiction, getting your Albion on, then off, then again. And there are no events after England, rhythm has taken their place, flowering, trees set out along the shoulder, pink and white as ideals of how England was or will be, the wrong words in the right order, an imaginary language with real poems in it. After England, empire moves west, but knowledge spins east, narrowly missing it or not. In the unsung songs of the dead, I came too late, after, as in so much further behind, you're out in front where not knowing is. And you call it experiment, the experiment of the sea pouring into the city, people into squares, forms that can't hold so much, weren't designed with this in mind, like the mind itself, builded here from ancient materials that couldn't predict the future or even rise to meet it, but maintain a right of way left through this hedge across two fields of hops and lavender, up the slope of the Iron Age fort till you drown in a view of the sea. That's it. John Shapta. Thank you, welcome everyone, and uh, thank you Cecil and Christopher for tonight and the upcoming series, really looking forward to it. Um, got three poems tonight. The first is called Poverty. The poor in spirit, with what are they blessed? What do they inherit? A feeling they can't shake no matter how many changes of address and manners of address they make. Persistent, like a phantom limb, a phantom stem, a sensation of unentitlement, an anxiety at registers and in examining rooms that they themselves will be repossessed, 
like a hollow body electric guitar, along with its amplifier. The president declared war on poverty, which was not a word we used in speaking of ourselves. Nonetheless, we enlisted in a corps to wage that war. Being poor, we were also the enemy, and we fought to put an end to ourselves as we knew them. Living at or below the sandbagged poverty line, we were as well the sodden field of battle, where cotton contended with cocklebur. What then was the impoverished spirit of our corps? We were deployed in a honey locust thornwood, a bleacherless playing field, and in our peeling town hall, squat and omnivorous like a bullfrog, with the library and courtroom upstairs, and downstairs the equipment room and jail. We were upstairs scraping and painting when the word went around that J.D. Stingray's daddy was cooling or sleeping it off down there. The son in question looked like all this was already happening inside his head. And we knew he would always look this way, though none of us looked at him. Instead, we applied ourselves with a furious delicacy to moldings, door facings, and hand railings, employing a technique we'd learned in the core called feathering the brush. The lethe. What's the word for what winds through memory? as through a distracted metropolitan area. Not her weakness personified, her many failings. Not forgetfulness, then, but a fitting counterpart, a release alongside which she can drowse and then rouse herself. Along the low iron railing at Cafe Orlan, Somebody built in a little gate. My server tells me she never noticed it before, and now she notices nothing else. No attention without inattention, a blurring wide and deep. And so, as this moment slips off to join the others, no remembering without a deep and a wide forgetting. No word, scarcely any idea of our power to relax our spasmodic grip on the past, that we feel gripped back like an electric glove, though it's limp and empty. To let go of the shudder, the pang, the droop, the gripe, to part on good terms with not squirrel away somewhere on your lopsided. To forgive, for lack of a better word, to give away. Poetry testifies to the best of its recollection about honeycomb on toast, cornfield smoke, Mr. Coppage's paddle, the slop man's scrap of tune. Too far gone to be called back. You can have a memory, not a forgetting. If poetry means to preserve a life, forgetfulness is lethal. Then again, the mockingbird strings each charm bracelet charm of gutturals, buzzes, warbles, and squeaks without a thought of what he just played, or is just about to, or where he picked it up from. A chickadee, a tree frog, a porch swing, 
even a long-gone mate, like the mimic bard showering her attention on the only poem while she writes it she'll ever write, or like the mimic bard constructing a birdhouse out of echo chambers whose songs must have migrated, or like the mimic bard polishing her elegy lest the name engraved there follow her everywhere. The mockingbird vocalizes atop a crepe myrtle with panicles crinkled deep pink. When she catches me listening, he flaps up with the car alarms, meep, 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 then glides to a mottled myrtle across the river. Brown sleeve out at the elbow, fraying into a rumpled haze. Bottomless silt, worrying some barely recognizable problem. You are dim and you are slippery, but when I cup you in the hollow of my hand, you taste like almost anything, in a word, fresh. Round County Almanac. Evenings such as this, one mounts hills. Even such a one, tall, portly, with an air of blessedness, an urge to be fruitful and conjugate. Tennessee, 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 Basque in apple moonshine, count up dominoes. Such a one mounting such a hill, chestnutted high point of a county round by law, imaginary hub of the parallelogram state, parallelogram being another word for poem. April is June here where rain runs to the gulf, and purple magnolia litter, bobwhite files are becoming. But when the thing one carries uphill is round, its spiced contents clear, why, the chaotic peaks of the eastern state line look like the slovens come to market. All bushel baskets and overalls smoking. Salamanders on moonlit balds will sprawl, and bats like notes from cavern mouths will spill, and slobbering black bears with a taste for a long cinnamon finish will put one not to rout but in mind of one's return railway ticket, one runs from nothing without leaving something, empty but upright in memory of oneself. Thank you. And uh, please welcome Preston Sutherland. Hello. Thanks, Cecil and Christopher. And since this will be my first confession since joining the community at Berkeley, thank you all um, very much for having me here as uh, the Holloway Poet, as your guest. Uh, it's a real honor, and truly, it's been a very happy experience so far, and I'm really looking forward to it. So, thanks. Uh, I'm going to read just one poem, which uh, unfortunately is this one called Under the Mattress, uh, which comes with an instruction to performers, which I guess I now am, which is Estatico Manon Troppo. Yes, the realities of life. Yes, bonded to terms like these. Tap the sexual hinge and drain its cataract of factual oil. 
Dreaming, you are made to hide from the guard sent for you by some anonymous communist tyrant dictating the incommunicable erotic meanings of your missing life to the deserving middle, whose orderly urban sprawl on the blanket contempt could never sink lower, but merely does at will on board the massive and passive aggressive illuminous tugboat of split level grill, where none of this or none of which makes much sense now or any equal time like this or then, where guards are all consumingly at large, have a dream in which to evade arrest, you squeeze your whole body under a mattress laid out intuitively horizontal on which now superficially outlays, overcharged and wasted, an obscurely misplaced a British military observer who is thereby on standby to be presumed innocent on the ground of his readiness to fall in with reality, not once but again and again by ever more expertly fucking his girlfriend. And once having been greatly squeezed under that mattress and gratefully to be there, it is still being done more expertly to her on his better and better fucking to excuse the strange imposition of a life directly under his peacekeeping pounding ass. You explain without meaning it or strangely caring that who should remain at large on the tugboat or free would needs risk being captured in vintage language just like that or some of something even more and as it turns out to good purpose and to your profit since he the observer whatever he is why ever he is there whatever only option you can take consciously permits himself to be swayed by these words, your words, to allow you who are for one moment or just about by a minimum of perfect resemblance his undeniable fellow stowaway in the Navy on the destroyer of desire and who would be a fellow stowaway of his by a yet greater quantity of perfect resemblance, approaching even the authentic but for your time and time again inflexible demonstrations of fluency in the chewed out pillow logicisms of barely whispered high civilian and your knowledge of its de-escalating effects like these so as even while being non-stick all over still somehow actually to be able to bear since there is no immediate other option sticking your body under the mattress and curling up there despite his manifestly not caring to discontinue his fuck on it holding himself up at breaking point where one more push will end it all come all ye faithful and once you are there tucked in discreetly as the predicament merits between the base grid of black metal springs and the overhead white rectangle you keep dead fucking still and for a reason you think should exist, but are not completely ready to know yet by yourself. Even the whole evasively your stuffed in body does not upset this mattress or serve even to make it effectively combust or disastrously tilt or represent an unmanageable unsexy lump or underlying protuberance pressed down in militant unison with gravity that would thwart any wound up military man in the execution of a truly professional fuck who himself sometimes likes to use that very word, the word fuck. It's often used in the military, despite being exactly then as now, exactly its actual size and shape. After puberty, you just don't grow anymore. Under the mattress, you lay your arms out crosswise on your chest. In the ear pressed down against black metal springs are later heard and condescendingly listened to many mortal intimations of a tinnitus for eels. We are slaves too, and we live with it, as the alternative is just madness and misery. The guards do come, twice, eventually first, then right away. And when they do come, they are seen to be looking for you. But for that moment, gambled on a flat percentage of its untold parallels in infinities unpaid over time, you are suddenly transformed into, or suddenly just now are, or you suddenly get at last to be the actor Roger Moore. Not only someone you are not, but worse, a walking wasted opportunity to find a proper object with a bit of actually contemporary traction. Instead, you end up not even the epitome of anything, just him. As the mattress bulges, identity wavers back to him again. Then negatives fall from heavens like a shower of seminal coins. You are not some other actors you once should have been, or had wanted to be, or were told you ought to be, or could remember and list, or later had it known to you without ever being really spoken to that you must need to be, or couldn't find a way up to, or just naively relied on thinking you would obviously be at some other point, or whom only once in your life you could never truly care if you were or not, but were not in any case, but him. Roger fucking Moore, as he might identify himself in anger to an erstwhile fan who had forgotten his name. By now, <laughs> scarcely even a vanishingly salient figure in this world, 
worse than it sounds. So completely that, before you know it, you were born on the 14th of October 1927 in Stockwell, now part of the London Borough of Lambeth, the only child of a cis policeman and his archaic housewife. You attended Battersea Grammar School and were evacuated to Holsworthy, Devon, during the war. You later attended the College of the Venerable Bede, but never graduated. The fit is almost wastefully exact, or else you split in two and scream, untrue! What does the end of that story do at first but never mean again? Under conscious pressure, liberalised to the cognitive equivalent of light-touch community policing, your new name, the actor, is spectacularly descrambled into groom, ogre, fuck her more, germ, erogenous gore, me, or who, her room, germaline, and or, and is the substitute for the more primary Sean Connery, himself also more or less absolutely the utmost figure to pick. And I really do want to fuck you more hard, just as this dream dictates when you wake each elastic thrust to bury love in no tomorrow. As Roger Moore, for pretty much the duration under the mattress, you were just slick and oily instead of in any way primarily hard, more fluent in all civilians from your pigeon to your oratory, not prepared to just sit back and scream yourself sick, admittedly not directly compelling in the monotony of your plastic oversophistication, but indirectly mandatory as the best sublimated bright sadistic instinct, sexy to all the wrong people like the actual NSA. The guards cannot find you to misapprehend as they leave. At last this scene breaks out in scenery. We lay down together at the top of the hill in the thousands of wavering flowers, made level with all of the sky that extended so far that the fading and muting of distance on colour could openly paralyse and shine. And on the ground I held you, and in you held me together. I love you is an easy thing to say. Now you say it. Bind your life around my life insanely slightly tight. Flood our perfect darkness with our best imploded light. Since my earliest idea of you, I have been shaking. Now I want you so much my skin is incessant, wild electric. Identity is a death tax. Fuck the dark away. Become right. Down in the square where none of this mess is to matter, not being caught signifies nothing less than whatever, because you want to be caught. Secretly, you want to be caught, to be made public, to be sexually reborn, to be extracted by love and purified, and made disgusting again. I want to be made disgusting again. But back on board the agnostic communist destroyer of articulated grill itself, this world, where this would have to be actually done, on whose only top deck the obscurely mock Asiatic tyrant is to be bloodthirstily beheld, rubber stamping in his manic depressive and way overdone productive waves of being his warrant for your arrest in a sea of best forgotten, fractionally fathomless 57% Mexican sexual froth. Never being caught remains the indispensable alibi for loving the wrong person forever. Thanks. Thank you to the readers, and thank you to the audience, and thank you to the uh, uh, University Press Books. Um, come back on the 26th of September, hear more of Keston Sutherland right now. Buy a book, uh, hang out, meet the poets. Thank you. Thank you very much.